Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to welcome all of you in the uh, King Khalid Federational uh, Grand Round uh, lecture for today. Our distinguished speaker is Dr. Adel Aqili, Associate Director of Outreach and Eligibility, Consultant of Federational Divisions in King Khalid, ISPHS Hospital, and he's the uh, ophthalmology champion in the Ministry of Health. Uh, his title is interesting, and he's going to talk about the reviving the dying art of scleral buckling. Uh, welcome, Dr. Adil, and uh, would like to start your talk if you don't mind. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hassan. Uh, I really appreciate the, appreciate the nice introduction. And uh, I would like to take you all in, uh, in a journey in, uh, in memory lane. So um, uh, in the beginning, I'm, uh, I'm going to show you a, a case. And, and I want you to think about how you would deal with this case. And then, and then we'll start our talk. So this is a 25 years old lady who has a vision of 20-20 in both eyes that recently had uh, refractive surgery. And she noticed that she developed a change in her vision in the right eye. Uh, so she comes to us uh, with this clinical picture. And if you can see, uh, there is this, um, this inferior retinal detachment with, uh, with PVR. And when you look into the OCT, uh, you find that the detachment actually has reached the, the level of the, uh, of the phobia, at the edge of the foveola, actually. And um, her vision is still 20-20. You look at the other eye, and you discover that she has this detachment. Uh, she is fortunate that this detachment is, is only reaching the edge of the macula, and the macula is not involved, but it's not a very pretty detachment. A lot of breaks, PVR as well, and, um, and she, she didn't even notice the change in the sign. So what do we do? Always when we think about uh, doing uh, retina surgery, uh, maybe, Maybe ourselves don't think of that much, but our colleagues and other specialties think about the complication that we might have. Glaucoma, cataract, uh, complications related to the surgery, such as uh, subretinal uh, perfluorocarbon, eventually uh, band keratopathy, and even endophthalmitis. This is when we go into talking into the tract. But uh, when when Jules gone in this, started uh, to describe the procedure almost 100 years ago, the scleral buckling, uh, he had another uh, an epiphany where he started this trend, which, we, which is still alive until now, which is the scleral buckling. Uh, there were a lot of uh, ways of treating uh, retinal detachment at the time, and most of them were, uh, were failures. And they actually uh, were uh, ended up with a lot of uh, complications that that uh, that are I mean very weird uh, for us right now. When he discovered the 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 idea of of the causative uh, break and its role in the pathogenesis of RD, his principle was to target this break and treat it, and then eventually the the retina was will flatten. He tried for a very long time until almost, so he started around 1920 and, and, and he waited till uh, the, his work was published in, in the 1930s and his disciples uh, started to um, have similar success and, and popularize the procedure which, is, uh, which we know now the treatment of retinal detachment. Uh, so again, there are, there are certain ideas that the scleral buckle uh, uh, work around, so we need to have good visualization. And the, the visualization starts from the from the presence of, of uh, the endocrine ophthalmoscopy. But the endocrine ophthalmoscopy was also something that was uh, discovered uh, late in the in the 18th century, in the 19th century, and it was uh, popularized with time by by uh, a lot of, of um, uh, retina surgeons such as uh, Amsler. And they, uh, they started even to draw the picture that we know now of, of the retina uh, in terms of uh, where are the breaks, the, the extent of the detachment, 
and the changes that we describe in our retinal exam. But it was Charles Keatons who actually uh, started the, the head-mounted indirect thermoscopy that we have now. And we use, uh, although with, with, with decreasing frequency in our clinic, but it's, it's still valid as an, and a very important uh, tool. And this was discovered or first started to be described in the, in the 1940s. He also described scared depression with that uh, procedure as well. And in terms of retinopexy, which is, which is the idea of, of attaching the retina, this was also discussed by many. And it was uh, not until uh, Harvey Linkoff who created the first cryoprobe where we started to use um, the same uh, te technique in our procedures. And this was discovered or started in the 1960s. Scleral buckling as a concept was uh, was there for some time, but it was uh, used uh, in the idea of uh, shortening the, the glow in order to uh, return the, the retina to, to its uh, position. However, uh, this was uh, done in, in, in very, very uh, different ways in terms of uh, scleral resection, and, and this, was, uh, this was a very different uh, idea at the time. But using the scleral buckle as we as we use it right now as support to the break, was initiated uh, later on in, in the 1930s. And what we have now in terms of um, uh, the, the technique of, uh, of using silicon uh, rubber implants and, and sponges and needles were all developed by, by uh, pioneers such as uh, Charles Kiffins and, and Harvey Link. So what are the techniques of scleral buckling? Uh, scleral buckling is a procedure that, that's basically um, a process rather than, the, than a surgery, uh, only a surgery. So you start the surgery or the process by a very careful pre-op assessment. And this includes talking about uh, the macular involvement features uh, of, of uh, the retin detachment, the presence of, of PVD, and other comorbidities, number of and, and positions, and, uh, and the level of the, of the retinal breaks, and the lens status. And we always remember this golden rule of, of uh, Linkoff, which the, he described in terms of the presence of the break and the, and the extent of the detachment. In terms of the surgery itself, uh, it's, it's very important to, to remember that, that uh, doing a, a very good uh, periotomy and um, uh, very well uh, dissecting the tenons capsule is, is very important in, in our surgery. This is how we do it. We snip the first time to open the, uh, the conjunctiva, uh, and, then, and then we snip the second time to open the tenon. And we also remember that, that as slinging the muscle is also, uh, uh, has to be as in a certain way. You want to go to the superior uh, rectus coming temporally and, and to the lateral rectus coming su superiorly in order to avoid uh, the, the slinging of the obliques. Uh, getting a very careful look at the sclera after you remove the conjunctiva is very important. You don't want to operate on a patient who has scleromalacia. And in terms of the visualization, we talked earlier about indirect thermoscopy. Uh, however, uh, there are very new uh, techniques that we are, uh, we are adopting these days uh, in terms of uh, using the chandelier uh, uh, into elimination light and uh, the, the, um, the visualization systems such as biome or recites. And you need to know that this, the, the visualization is, is the most important part of the surgery. So, so it's always advised to keep this in mind in terms of, of operation, be operating, because uh, if, if you don't see in a scleral buckle, and, and, and in any surgery actually, uh, you basically are, are looking for trouble. Remembering how we do the examination is very important. So you want to depress on the break, and you always want to remember the, the parallax phenomena where you actually can depress uh, and, and the difference in level of the retinal, high retinal detachment and, and the sclera can, can sometimes produce uh, differences. So you, you can see that the break here is at this level, 
but when you depress and uh, at the level that you see during your exam, you basically are depressing more posterior. And this can come with its own uh, problems. Retinopexy, as it evolved, is now a very um, uh, nice and, and, and simple procedure. You look at how we're doing the cryopexy in these days, look uh, directly uh, compressing the break and then, uh, and then applying the laser. In this case, it was a single break where we actually could treat it with just one treatment. And you can see how the dark retina appears uh, and confirms the, the presence of the break. Sometimes you have those large breaks that you can't actually treat with, uh, with one application of, uh, of cryo. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm talking about cryo here. So you might need to apply it in, in different location to, uh, but you need to keep in mind that you don't want to uh, treat the same area twice because of the risk of the cryo as well. And there is this very um, known and very uh, worrisome uh, chance of, of you missing the, the exact time location of your depression with the cryo, where you actually might compress with, your, with, your, with the shaft of the cryo and then laser somewhere uh, even posteriorly, which, which might cause very posterior laser treatment. There are other modalities for retinopexies. We, we know that we, we utilize a lot and uh, laser and direct ophthalmoscopy in the OR. There has been also talk about diode and, and treating uh, retinal breaks. However, this is uh, something that has not been adopted a lot. And you can also see that we still have the chance of treating with laser even after the procedure. In, in an outpatient setup. I would also, uh, talking about- the additional posterior hole was identified the, under the inferior rectus muscle because the bulkier the cryoprobe so had difficulty also accessing. Also another technique that has been was made to proceed with marking of the break and placement of the buckle with external fluid drainage. With, Here we see the break now supported on the buckle. A continuous moderate power laser is then applied using an endolaser probe for retinopexy. After an anterior chamber paracentesis, the trocar is removed and the sclerotomy is sutured. Keys in our small experience using laser probes in non vitrectomized eyes is minimizing insertion of the probe and using a larger spot size and continuous moderate power laser. This is a potential useful adjunct in situations where extensive therapy is required, such as lattice degeneration, and access to indirect laser is more limited. Talking about sclera and uh, explants, uh, there has been a lot of development in this field in the past, but now we, we reach uh, the, the consensus that uh, that. Uh, the use of silicon is, is a very, um, uh, as a very uh, inert material and, and, and has been very well tolerated for a very long time. These are all examples of, of what we have in terms of um, uh, silicon uh, exoplants. As we can see here, these are the tires in, a, in their different uh, sizes. And also you can see uh, the, the different segments and then the sponges. And, and the sleeves and the bands that we tend to use a lot in, in, in our patients. It's important to know that this does not come with its, or with its own complication. There has been reports of, of, um, of uh, sponge uh, inf uh, abscesses, uh, and this is why we don't have the air cells opened in these. These are all closed cell air, air sponges, or, or uh, uh, um, closed air uh, cell sponges. And these are the effects that we see with, with the sponges. We, we typically think of them as, um, a, a, as a way to treat uh, local, uh, locally some, uh, uh, some uh, as our breaks. And this happens uh, as we target them very carefully. Whereas in the cases of tires, we tend to use them as, um, as part of our uh, 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 broad uh, uh, adhesions uh, or broad uh, uh, support to the to the retina, so they typically have a lower height but but broader uh, reach. In terms of suturing, we use um, durable uh, materials which are biocompatible because these are non-absorbing sutures. We want them to be easy to handle because we know we are we are going into very uh, small spaces uh, going back in the sclera to reach uh, our anchoring sutures. So uh, monofilament nylon has been uh, used very frequently. However, there are some uh, braided polyester which are, uh, which are more uh, easy to handle and, and has uh, gained traction a lot recently. It's important to know that these 
nylons are, are very helpful in terms of having the memory to, to stick and the friction that we have between the two uh, threads will help us uh, uh, not need any, any support during suturing those, uh, those, uh, those bands. Uh, always remember that suturing um, is always uh, an art, especially in those uh, buckle cases, because you want to be uh, parallel in, in orientation and you have to have the long axis of the explant uh, uh, in between the, those sutures. So you want to have radial uh, suture bites for radial explants and circumferential for circum circumferential implants. And remembering the size of your, your, um, your element and, and this, the, the distance between your bites is very important in order to, to create the, the, the desired depression. So, so this is one of the cases that we're using a radial buckle. And if you can see here how we're, uh, it's, it's very difficult to reach this, uh, this position. It might have been easier to come the other way around. And then at the end, removing the suture, you want to be careful not to injure the sclera with the heel of your, uh, of your uh, uh, knee. Now looking at how we are actually introducing our, our sponge in this case, uh, and, and how we, we want to uh, suture it in a, in a way that, that supports the position we want. There are also some ad uh, diff advances in the technique. So now we have been uh, using more frequently the scleral tunnels, which are uh, very useful in, in especially the non-high myopic patients. Uh, it can uh, be uh, somewhat... Uh, uh, less time consuming than, than the suturing and, and especially if you're using those kind of uh, curved crescent knives, it, it can also accommodate very nicely your uh, 240 bands. And at the end, you might not even need to suture those uh, when, when you reach uh, the Watson stage. So retina fluid drainage is, is one of the debatable issues when we talk about um, scrub buckling and in, in an undemised controlled trial, uh, there was no difference actually uh, or advantage for subretinal uh, fluid drainage. Uh, however, we want to know which are the cases that are, that are, sub, uh, that, that are selected or preferred to be treated with subretinal fl uh, fluid drainage because um, depending on the height and, and the configuration of the detachment, you might want to do uh, drainage in some cases. And so it's always helpful to familiarize yourself with the technique, even if you don't frequently use it. So there are different techniques of uh, drainage. The, the general concept was in terms of the timing, you want to drain and uh, use air if this is one of your uh, techniques, and then do cryo and then put the explant. Uh, this will help you know where exactly is the break after you drain, and then, and then uh, when you do your cryo, you're sure that you're treating the exact location of, of the break um, uh, in, in relation to the sclera. You want to avoid uh, the ciliary nerves and the vortex veins because you don't want to fall into this uh, very uh, uh, scary complication of developing a subretinal hemorrhage uh, during this uh, step. This can happen, especially in, in those fresh detachments where the subretinal fluid is not very thick because the blood will typically gravitate to the macula because it's the, uh, the most dependent point in, in the back of the eye. And you want to also remember that uh, there are other techniques of, of uh, different techniques of doing this. So you can uh, do the cut down, technique, cut down technique where you dissect through the sclera fibers until you reach the choroid and then, and then you, you open the choroid. Uh, or you can use the, um, uh, the, the needle uh, technique where you actually can control exactly how much you're going in by, by measuring the, the, the distance between the edge of the needle and, and your needle holder. And there are other techniques such as um, cryotherapy, uh, diathermy or direct, um, uh, direct aspiration. This was a very nice technique that was described by our uh, friend and colleague, Dr. Abdullah Abdullah. And actually, he uh, he was nominated. He 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 won a, a, a one of one of the Euritanus, uh, video presentations about it. 
where he actually is introducing a carefully under direct visualization the 26 gauge uh, uh, needle with a cannula and then control by controlling the injection of the fluid he expresses the subretinal fluid uh, and 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 doing it in a very controlled way and you can see how in total in subretinal fluid here there is another technique uh, or another instrument that can be used in this in this kind of situation maybe this is not the typical uh, the, the picture you want to see with the scale buckle however uh, this was a case of uh, of a trd that had uh, uh, subretinal fluid and no breaks and it was very bullless so so this was very useful uh, you can see the rubber uh, ball there is protecting you from from um, injuring the sclera until or penetrating the sclera until you reach the, the exact area. And, and as we inject the perfluoron here, we're expressing the fluid into this, uh, into this uh, device that was connected to a syringe. And this is how you, you might be uh, able to drain uh, in, a, in a controlled manner. So uh, talking again about, about sclera we mentioned earlier that the, the, that complication that might develop with vitrectomy. However, complications uh, from uh, or sclerobuckle by itself is not uh, immune from complications. And these are just um, some examples. We have uh, fish mouthing uh, of the break here, uh, and and this is uh, due to those radial folds that developed from a tight uh, buckle, and a missed break here that was not uh, treated, and 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 a, and a break that was not. Uh, Actually, the a buckle that was not high enough to support the, buck, the break. There are so many different techniques of doing uh, scleral buckle, and this one re this is the reason why uh, you should pick and choose what what's best for you. Because uh, I think scleral buckle is here to stay again. So this is one technique that was described by our our uh, colleague, Doctor uh, uh, Juan um, um, Martinez Yepes where he does a periotomy uh, uh, sparing uh, scleral buckling. This is how I, uh, I, I learned that from him. You basically do your traction, uh, bridal sutures as you do in the ACCE, and then you start uh, creating your, uh, conjuncti your, uh, your limited uh, conjuncti conjunctival openings uh, at the edge of the, um, uh, uh, between the muscles and then and then here we're using the scale tunnel technique to go through the whole um, uh, four uh, quadrants and passing uh, underneath the muscle without even opening the conjunctiva there uh, can also be, uh, be done. And then uh, ending up by, uh, by putting the sleeve in. And the patient was, uh, was happy from the cosmetic results uh, in the first immediate uh, post-operative uh, period. Again, you want to use whatever suits you to, to get the job done. So you might even need to use uh, uh, radial buckles and then discover that, uh, that, you, uh, that there are other breaks and then use another radial buckle. And in this case, we, we use two uh, radial, uh, buck, uh, radial buckles for a patient who had two breaks in, a, in, in different levels and did not need to place um, uh, an encircling band in this case. Sponges can be used in any way you want. It's not just radially. You can use them even in a, in a somewhat circumferential uh, uh, situation. This is a patient who had a, a chronic RD with those massive cysts. And then um, we, 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 we reverted to using the, the, um, the sponges in a, in a circumferential, semi-circumferential uh, way. We were actually treated less than 180 uh, or, or supported only less than 180 uh, degree of, of the retinal um, uh, of the of the retina uh, inferiorly. Again, the concept with the sponge is that you want to tighten it as much as you can uh, in order to displace it into the uh, into the and push the sclera into posteriorly. Uh, and this will, uh, although at the, at the first post-operative uh, or immediately you won't feel that indentation, it might even increase later on. So going back to the case I discussed earlier, 
this patient that we, we mentioned that had uh, 20, that was 25 years old and had those um, uh, the, this uh, detachment macula involved in, in the right eye and, and uh, the macula uh, on in the left eye. Uh, we had to um, discuss with her the options of, of operating. Uh, we know that sometimes the subretinal fluid can progress in a slow manner. However, uh, she was very uh, keen to get, to get treated for the situation. And this is a very um, important added value that you get with sclerobuckle. We ended up operating in this patient in both eyes, where we placed an encircling band in, in the right eye. And in the left eye, we, insert, we placed an encircling band and then added an element uh, of a radial uh, sponge that supported the uh, posterior inferior break. And she ended up uh, being flat and uh, did not need to have any, any vitrectomy. So again, we think when we think about scleral buckle, the general concept here is that, is that we want to remember when, where we came from. We came from uh, a disease that was tackled uh, by extraocularly, and and although this was um, this was a very difficult uh, procedure in the beginning, there was there was good success rate in the beginning of the of uh, almost 100 years ago. So now that we are developing new technologies and, and, and new techniques and, and different visualization systems and, and our abilities to, to understand the anatomy and the pathology of the disease has increased, I think that looking at what we had in our hand and, and involving it has a very important value. Knowing that this is a very useful tool um, makes us uh, work with it as much as we can. Um, however, we want to remember that this, this procedure, and, and it's understandably less uh, popular these days because of the risk that it, it bears. And this is one article that was uh, mentioned, uh, th that they mentioned uh, uh, the effects of, of uh, the, the duties that we do as ophthalmologists on our, uh, on our, on our health. And if you think this, about this discussion about uh, about a cataract surgeon who prefers, uh, performs a surgery in, in less than 30 minutes uh, and only sees the patient with, uh, with a slit lamp compared to a surgeon that would stay, a uh, retina surgeon that will do a, a scare bucket in, in a in, um, uh, conventional way where, where he will use the indirect for all the procedure uh, for a very long time. You can imagine how worse will his back be and I understandably, this is why many of our, our retina surgeons colleagues have lost the interest in the procedure. But this does not mean that this is the end of the way. I think that it's always remembered, important to remember that if you think that this procedure is the right procedure for the patient, you have to do what's right. And in that case, in my belief uh, that I presented to you earlier, I think that the right, the right decision was, was to do a scale buckle. So when you think about it in this way, uh, you want to work on developing the methods to make this procedure tolerable for the surgeon and the patient as well. And this will only happen with, with evolution and trying new techniques and, and, and adopting new, 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 new uh, technologies. So this is what took us to what we're trying to, what we, um, what we did in, in, in this case, uh, in the study that I'll present to you that was published recently in the uh, American Journal of Case Reports. This was a study that, uh, that we, we uh, shared our technique in, in, in chandelier assisted sclera buckle uh, using a uh, heads, up, heads up display system. Uh, so uh, basically the chandelier endoelimination has been used for buckle uh, for some time. Uh, the, it had the added value of, of show, showing uh, real time uh, what's happening to whoever is in the room, whether it's a trainee or, 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 or your consultant if you're a trainee as well. So it has been proven to be a very good educational tool and there has been a lot of publication about it. And it was one of the reasons why a lot have came back to using uh, scale buckle uh, after they stopped uh, doing so. What we described here also in that technique is in, in this paper was uh, using scleral tunnel. 
Um, Dr. Hassan, do you hear me? I think I'm. Uh... Dr. Hassan, do you hear me? We hear you. Okay, excellent. Because I, I, I was, I had the message that I was signed out. Okay, so scale tunnel uh, um, ha was associated with these complications uh, compared to uh, uh, to uh, scleral suturing. This was uh, in terms of the number of, of inadvertent per penetration. We know that scale tunnel can cause uh, uh, perforation as well, but also uh, buccal infections and and uh, extrusions have been uh, shown to be less. It also av avoid the unnecessary and um, irregular buckle that occurs sometimes with suturing because it's usually an even uh, plane that you work on. And, and, and it also helps us prevent the unnecessary um, uh, or, or uh, not necessary to tighten the band more than the required uh, that, that we have sometimes in cases of uh, scleral buckle um, in a routine way. A 3D visualization system, which was also used in this technique, uh, has also proven to be a better, uh, provides a better image quality, field of view, focus, focus of depth, illumination, and uh, ergonomics. And also uh, has been shown to reduce the light uh, uh, toxicity because you can reduce uh, the amount of, of light that you introduce into the eye um, using the same setting. So in this study, we uh, reported the anatomical and functional outcomes of chandelier-assisted scleral buckle with sutureless scleral tunnel uh, using uh, 3D visualization system in primary phacic uh, rheumatogenous retinal attachment. We included um, patients in uh, King Khaled Eye Specialist Hospital from March 2019 to February uh, 2020. And all the patients we did underwent uh, general anesthesia with encircling band and standard uh, cryo to, uh, to the therapy to the break with no uh, additional elements. And this is the demographics of the patients. You see that most of them were the, to the younger side uh, and most of them had inferior detachment with multiple breaks in, in, in one of the patients. Uh, and, and one of them had the uh, retinous cases. The best corrective visual acuity was, was uh, actually good to begin with in most of those patients. And this is how we do our procedure. We start by slinging, uh, opening the conjunctival uh, periotomy, slinging the muscles, and then uh, creating our, uh, uh, isolating the break or localizing the break and then treating it with, uh, with uh, cryotherapy. And then creating our um, uh, cut down, uh, partial thickness cut down of the sclera, uh, which I use uh, the crescent uh, blade uh, available from, from Alcon, and I have no financial disclosure here, or financial uh, associations. We pass the, the, the band uh, underneath uh, the muscle, and it's, it's important to know, and, and I, I tend to do this a lot, is you, you want to, um, one reason that many don't like to do buckles is that you feel that you need the help of others uh, during the procedure. So adopting a, a way that, that you hold um, uh, this, the, the, the muscle, the traction of sutures and then passing uh, the, sleeve, the band by yourself and, and uh, receiving it from the other side will be very helpful in terms of, um, in terms of you doing more procedures because you don't always have, uh, have a good um, uh, assistant with you in the surgery. And in this case, we actually uh, sutured with the uh, absorbable switch of the conjunctiva. However, uh, you can do this with, uh, with the cautery without the need of, of any sutures. Uh, so in terms of the results, uh, we were successful in, in uh, reattaching the retina in, in five of those six cases. And the visual outcome was, uh, was uh, good. Uh, one of them who did not achieve the primary success um, uh, with a buckle uh, needed uh, another uh, uh, vitrectomy 
and was uh, successful. So the, the overall success rate in, in our small uh, series was 100%. The reason for, for that uh, failure of the primary buckle was the, with that uh, there was a missed uh, break in that case. And um, so, so which, which was uh, normal uh, when you talk about square bucket, that's a very well known um, reason for failure. Um, so back to the point that I was mentioning earlier about how scale buckle is an important tool that's still adopted in, in our uh, in our practice. This is the this is the results of, of the second report for the primary written detachment outcome study, uh, where they actually compared um, vitrectomy uh, or scale buckle combined with vitrectomy. Uh, sorry, scale, scale buckle alone with vitrectomy alone or uh, combined with the SB. And they noticed that the success rate was actually um, in, the, in the late 80s, uh, uh, actually, uh, sorry, it was in the 92% uh, in, in, in this uh, study group, uh, which was higher than that one that was, that was achieved with the vitrectomy group. Although it's always important to know that these these uh, studies that compare uh, different procedures, such as those, uh, how, as much as you want to control the groups and, and the decision to make the surgery, it's always uh, difficult to prove that this is actually a better technique because it you target different uh, kind of patients with the with the primary uh, buckle. However, uh, it is still in 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 some instance even more successful than doing the vitrectomy. So. You need to know that this is a very important part of our practice still, even if you feel that you're not doing it as much. And um, so in, in conclusion to, of our study, uh, uh, the heads up sutureless chandelier assisted uh, scale buckle uh, offers an excellent solution for surgeon in terms of visualization, uh, ergonomics. It's safe to the patients. Uh, from uh, suture-related complication and, and even written toxicity. And it's also a superior educational tool for trainees. And this is um, why adopting it in, a, in, in, a, in an academic setting can be uh, a reason for us to teach our fellows uh, and, and help them uh, adopt scale buckling more than, uh, than they would do in, in, in other settings. So uh, in conclusion of the study, I think it's, it's time to bring the SV back. Uh, I just want to mention at the, at the end of this, this talk that, that um, at the remaining um, uh, vitrectomy is a very important part of our treatment too. So that this does not take anything away from this. However, um, thinking about scleral buckle in, a, in, a, in an old conventional way would always uh, make it lose in any comparison with vitrectomy. But if you go to this uh, thinking of div advancing scale buckling and making it uh, uh, an attractive option for a surgeon in terms of ergonomics, in terms of, of, of visualization, in terms of the time that they spend in the surgery, you will always uh, manage to keep it uh, viable and, and people will adopt it and more trainees will, will adopt it. And with this, I, I would like to um, conclude my talk and thank uh, Dr. Hassan for, uh, for moderating and thank you all for attending. Thank you, uh, Dr. Aguirre, for this really uh, interesting, informative talks. And thanks for bringing back the scale buckle <laughs> in the pictures, because um, we thought at the time that scale buckle is no more having a place to deal with the, with the uh, written adaptment surgery. But I would like to thank you for this. And uh, it was really it's important to get back to know the arts of the square buckle with different techniques when you have to do it, when you have to combine it, and you have to make sure you know when you are using a square buckle, you have two types: the circling band as a prophylactic, or I mean that to just support the peripheral retina or the fibula space. And when you do it as a treatment, primary treatment for for the uh, retinal detachment. Uh, different techniques were developed with the new era of the uh, uh, micro incision and chandelier lights, uh, the microscopes, even through the 3Ds. So all this is, could be 
uh, facilitate to use the uh, scleral buckle. In the past, we are using only the indirect ophthalmoscope. So your stereopsis chip work very well. Localizations use the dynamic and static localizations. And when you miss the you know, localization, a uh, whole of the procedure could be failed while it could be give could uh, excellent success if things done on the right way. Uh, by this, I would like to open the, you know, the discussions and if uh, having any questions or comments, I would like to uh, invite you all. We will have uh, Dr. Mark with us. I see his, uh, his uh, you know, uh, bus is muted. If you would like to share us this discussion. Marco? Hello, hi, Asan. Yes, hi. Hi, now I, I listen with interest to the new techniques. Congratulate Adel for uh, being uh, inventive in this new, new way of doing buckles. I'm still old fashioned, you know, I like to do my buckles uh, with the indirect. Um, I think I'm more free in the movements and it's uh, for me easier than doing it with a microscope. But uh, for sure, the advantage of this technique is that it's easier for the one I'm not used to use the indirect uh, to localize it. Localization is the most important in the scleral buckling, you know. Uh, and for sure, using the chandelier, it's easier to localize the break uh, if you don't have a lot of uh, experience with the indirect nowadays. Um, but I mean, whatever it works for me is fine. Both techniques are very good. Um, and um, uh, just a personal preference. Um, and uh, it's good that Dr. Adel brought us back and remind us about this uh, technique, which nowadays is very much uh, forgotten almost by the younger generation. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, still with your um, you know, way that I'm using the indirect. Just I'm divided when I get the presbyopia. So I starting to use the, <laughs> starting to use the microscope to put my suit chair, placing the you know, radial or encircling bands. And it's in that um, it's a good use at certain point, although the field getting a little less, but it's really more accurate and easily you can know where you have to go in the sclera, especially with this people, high myopes, thin sclera, because, you know, uh, their sclera is very thin to extend that you can get in, you know, without uh, noticing that. So that's, it's, a, it's using the microscope might help a lot in that. Dr. Adil, would like thank to make you, a comment yeah, on that? Thank you, Dr. Marco and Dr. Hassan. Uh, I, I, I don't want to make you show you in, a, in an old uh, fashion way, but, uh, but the reality is uh, when, we, when I started my fellowship, uh, and I think t a, lot of, uh, a lot of us these days are tending to use a lot the, the 90 diopter lenses with the set lamp and, and maybe sometimes using the, the contact lenses to look at the peripheral retina. We, unfortunately, uh, using the indirect thermoscopy is, is also an art by itself. So uh, being very comfortable doing that is, is a key in, in, in adopting this, uh, this uh, procedure. However, what I'm suggesting here that even if you don't uh, master the technique, this is a chance for you to work with a scleral buckle. And it, it actually, the alternative is offering you even a more, um, uh, to be honest, a better uh, visualization from the indirect. Uh, let's be honest. Um, and, and, a, and a very important note here that when you talk about uh, chandelier assisted buckle, the, the discussion always uh, is, is, is it safe? Are we talking about uh, introducing something into the eye that might cause the risk of endophthalmitis? Uh, and this is, this is an argument that I, I'm sure a lot uh, would, would, would uh, mention. And, and in my opinion, I, I believe that although this is a risk, uh, but uh, knowing that, that sometimes we feel ourselves because we're not comfortable with the buckle, doing a vitrectomy in a patient who would definitely uh, do better with a buckle, actually means, wo means worse for the patient. You end up with, with PVRs that are, that are difficult to manage, attachment that recurs a lot, and maybe if you did a buckle the first time and it worked, it would have saved you the whole, uh, the whole hassle and the patient the whole hassle. So talking about this, and, uh, and comparing it to the very low risk of developing endophthalmitis or, or whatever uh, uh, complications that are related to buckle uh, can 
can can can make a lot of sense uh, in term, uh, and 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 support the buckle a lot. Well, it was the concept in the past that we do an extra ocular procedure rather than to go uh, intraocular. So that's now the modifications to use the you know chandelier lights. It might help a lot. But in the past, we don't like to go to go inside the eye. We are using the buckle. You know, in the past, we are using you know big tires. You know, which is almost if you look for it, you can reach to the arcades. You know, yes. which is yes. really really it's a, something that I don't like to use it anymore by the time being. But in the past, you know, our vitrectomy limited. We cannot have wide fields. We don't have that extent to see all of the, you know, that the peripheral retina. So using this is most likely it make the retina flat. By the end, yeah, is using this, using a lot of cryo. At certain stage, we change to using the cryo using transscleral diode lasers, which came in in certain areas. Uh, uh, so it is really evolving and getting more now to use more safe procedure than the getting you know you know in the intensive intensive but sometimes you know certain eyes you'd like to avoid the vitrectomy as much as you can yeah, because absolutely. once you get in certain bad vitreous you might not I mean, you know uh, be able to, uh, to 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 repair that rds and getting in the bfr and lost eye so sometimes uh, buckle is really it's a good procedure for such uh, people uh, i looked for the study that you mentioned you know and comparing you know that doing buckle alone, vitrectomy uh, alone, or, uh, uh, you know, combined for primary repair. And it's really short some, some, but I think so this is most likely depends on the experience and, you know, the selection. selection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, the, of, the, of the surgeons. Uh, uh, any questions anymore? Because I don't see the, you know, hands up so that I can see select who would like to ask questions. But opening, I see Dr. Suleiman with us here, he might who would like to add, or Dr. Abdelilah, Dr. Noelati, any one of them, or anyone he would like to ask or add comments. So um, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Noelati. Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, um, thank you very much, thank you, Dr. Sleban, Dr. Dibi, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Akrili. That was a most wonderful lecture. You went thank through you. the steps and you went through the beautiful history. Um, and you you carried it further further with the new um, you know methods of doing things. Um, I, I fully agree with you that in order to do any procedure right, you have to you have to see. And people shy away when they don't see when they don't when they don't have the control of what they're doing and what they're seeing. And this is why people a long time ago shied away from going into a vitreoretinal specialty because we used to do the you know, the, the uh, treatments with yeah. the very small lenses and small fields of view. And then, you know, once uh, the, you know, the, the major, you know, the pan fundus view that you have now in vitreoretinal surgery happens, you know, people are, are happy to do that. But, you know, so the, the message here is that you really uh, cannot be a fully vitreoretinal surgeon if you don't master the art of scleral depression and endotic ophthalmoscopy. That is, a, that is a must, you know, that is for the fellows and for everybody. And once you have that, then the scleral buckling becomes an art and it's actually it's mathematics and, and gymnastics for the brain because you you yeah. you work on the eye you see you know where your breaks are and then you kind of have to do the gymnastics of the brain what would work best you know what is the least amount of things that i can do that can get the job done and uh so every every surgery is different and that is very very um, very, you know, we're very happy to, to do that instead of going into a routine, you know, vitrectomy, gas, yeah. vitrectomy, gas, and have you, you know, yeah. and the, no, and the very, very satisfying thing is for the patient. And what you said about, you know, you have to do what is right for the patient. That is absolutely crucial. So, um, when you, the next day, when you see the patient and the patient is, you know, has a clear vitreous and clear media and, and is able to see very well. And you know that the retina has settled down. That is so satisfying to both. So um, thank you very, very much. I'm a little hesitant, honestly, to, to if, I, if I had to do it again, I would be a little hesitant to do this scleral tunneling thing. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, you know I mean, it, I, I, I guess it works. So it's, uh, it's good to adopt it. And I agree with Hassan that, uh, that when we get, reach a presbyopic age, it's much better to, to do the suturing with the RD1 needle, you know, to the, under the scope so that you can visualize the, 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 uh, 
the the scleral depth that you're in. But I just wanted to thank you. You you covered everything, um, and um, I just wanted to thank you for bringing this back. It's 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 a joy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm preparing myself for the first application. Mr. <laughs> 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 yeah, just I wanted to uh, echo what Dr. Noelati said. Um, I have nothing to add to the discussion. I want to congratulate Dr. Adel for the job well done. In terms of the procedure, taking things, uh, adopting new techniques and the new modalities, and for the excellent lecture. Thank you, Dr. Adel. Dr. Adel, your talks and last. <laughs> uh, I, I just, I just want to remind uh, everyone that that not just for square buckling itself, but always trying new stuff, adopting new techniques, uh, trying out um, new technologies, uh, you know, tweaking, playing with new devices that you, you get, and, and, and challenging yourself uh, is very important to, to evolve as a surgeon. This is, this is as ophthalmologists, as surgeons, uh, we pride ourselves of being uh, very, very um, uh, delicate and very, uh, uh, very well skilled, and I think this is something that we we should always adopt uh, in in in, the, in our way of thinking of research. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Adil. Uh, you know, uh, just one small things that just in the last two weeks, uh, just getting a patient that who had uh, you know uh, scrub buckle in form of circling band, done maybe uh, three or four years ago, and uh, when I looked for it, you know, it was great. The retina is flat. But when I looked for the height of the buckle, it was really, <laughs> what I can say, it is making the uh, retina is shocking, you know, <laughs> too high. So this is one of the things that when we are doing our buckle, we have to look for the, all the aspects, not to have it too tight. Uh, at the time, we'd like to make the retina is flat as much, but actually because it's affecting a lot of the patient's refractions and might lead to complications, erosions, so uh, doing the buckle in the right way is really a great, and it's it's a, it's really a great uh, fun to do and an art. So uh, I would like all of you, if you can, have the times to go back to this and do it in a, a patient that could be treated only with buckle rather than to go with intraocular uh, procedure. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Very Thank you easy. very much. Thank you very much for your really great uh, talk. And I would like to thank you all for your attending this uh, 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 grand round and see you inshallah soon. Thank you.